All right, Jude 1. Notice that the author of sanctification is from God the Father. That's one. What we're going to talk today is sanctification. Sanctification, I think, is one of the most important doctrines in soteriology as well as Christianology, if there is such a word. In other words, related to the doctrine of salvation or the doctrine of Christian living, sanctification is one of the most important doctrines. Justification was phenomenal. We got a huge blessing out of that one. Salvation is quite a doctrine. Redemption is an amazing doctrine. Remission or forgiveness is another amazing doctrine. Adoption, that is quite phenomenal. But believe it or not, sanctification is perhaps better than all those doctrines. Sanctification is not just salvation at the beginning where it saved you from hell, but it is something for your everyday life. It is a complete salvation, not just a salvation of the soul where you got saved from hell. Now, I'll explain all that, but let's first cover the first section, which is the author of sanctification. And there are three beings within the author of sanctification, which is a no-brainer. First is God the Father in Jude 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father. See that? Now notice that God the Son is also involved in your sanctification. Hebrews 13, 12. Hebrews 13, 12. Literally, the verses will say sanctified, and it will identify each person in the Godhead or Trinity. So it shows that there's something important. Why is it necessary for each being in the Trinity to be involved in your sanctification process? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 12, Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people. See that? So Jesus, God the Son, is also involved. And then 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and verse 13. Verse 13. Does a verse specifically point out that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is involved for the exact word sanctification? Absolutely. Notice the Bible reads, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the what? Spirit. Spirit. Now, there's a particular reason why when we look at the board over here, if you know from your basic discipleship, your beginner's discipleship lesson, we talked about the tripartite being of man. We also talked about the Trinity. Now, there's a relation with those two topics. Each person of the Trinity represents each tripartite being of man. So, Jesus Christ represents the body, God represents the soul, and the spirit represents the spirit. So, mind, I think, is incorrect. It should be spirit. But nevertheless, the point is, is this drawing... It kind of helps out where you can picture it. Why is that important? Because in order to be sanctified, and if you're sanctified by each person of the Godhead, they must sanctify then each part of your being. That is important because the three parts of who you are are going to be made holy. Not just salvation then. We automatically assume the soul saved from hell. But think about this. Then your spirit also needs to be pure. We might take it for granted the spirit's already pure at salvation. But that's not the case. And we're thinking that our body has to be made holy. But then a lot of times we doubt our salvation, don't we? Because if we're really saved, why does our body keep sin sinning? But then reality hits us where we know that it's impossible not to sin in our body after we get saved. 
So then how does that reconcile? So we have to understand that sanctification then is very important. We don't really understand what that really means. When you hear that term sanctification, you assume you already know, don't you? Because that's a basic doctrine. Oh, I already know. No, you don't know. Like I keep telling you many times, the things that you think you do know, you'll be surprised when you go back to the basics how much you don't know. So it is very necessary to go back to the basics. Basics can give you something new. Understanding that, then if three persons of the Godhead, God himself is the author of sanctification. Now, did we look at those three verses? Did those three verses point out sanctification is given by God himself out of the three persons? The spirit for your spirit, Jesus for your body, the Father for your soul. Do you believe that? Then, see, already you're clicking if you concentrate on the basics. The answer is given then that to be holy is not from yourself. It's more of a gift from God himself. And if you want to purify, make holy on all three parts, you got to realize who the author is. So sanctification is a gift to us after salvation. It's not an accomplishment on your part. So this gift that is given to you, you've got to put it to good use. It's not of your own. It's a gift from God himself. So I think now we have to talk about the meaning of sanctification. If we want to understand how this works and why we're not using it properly, if it truly is a gift, why aren't we using it? Well, I think we don't understand the meaning. So let's talk about the next section, meaning of sanctification. Two passages, Exodus 30 and Leviticus 11. Exodus 30 and Leviticus 11. These two passages are going to point out that sanctification and holiness are the same essence. So when you hear that word, I'm sure most of you automatically assume holy, right? Sanctification or sanctify means to be holy or make holy. That's pretty much on the same essence there. We're on the same essence there. It's not the quite specific definition, but they're sharing the same essence. So we'll get to the specifics after that. But let's start with the basic and then build it up. We're in, the, we're in the ballpark here. We're in that essence there. Sanctification and holiness equate. So let's start it out, that foundation first. Exodus 30, 29. Notice, for Moses said, had said, consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man. Oh, excuse me. I'm at chapter 32. Uh, what am I reading there? Okay. Here we go. And thou shalt sanctify them, that they may be most holy. So they're in the same ballpark, there's no doubt. Leviticus 11, 44. Leviticus 11, 44. Notice how sanctify and holiness are in the same meaning here. For I am the Lord your God, that's verse 44. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy. For I am holy, neither shall ye defile yourselves. Okay, now go to Second Chronicles 29. Second Chronicles 29. And then your second hand to go to Leviticus 27. Leviticus 27. Again, there are Second Chronicles 29 and Leviticus 27. Understanding that sanctification and holiness, they mean the same thing, we're going to specify more on that meaning now. So it comes in two important meanings, always. This is a basic thing that most Bible teachers, including those of wrong doctrine realize about sanctification. 
So if you Bible believers don't know it, it will be shameful. So you need to know this, okay? So sanctification has two important meanings for this one definition. It's not just one. The first part of it is separation from evil. So 2 Chronicles 29, verse 5, notice verse 5. It points out, And said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves, and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers. Notice the sanctification has separation from sin, and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. So when that word sanctify is used, to be made holy is used, that means you've got to get rid of the filthiness, the sin. Now in verse 15, 15, And they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. See, that sanctify is getting rid of the filthy stuff inside the temple. Uh, verse 16, notice right here, they cleanse the uncleanness. See that? Verse 17, they continue to sanctify up to the balcony, the porch. And it went for days long. Verse 18 is the same thing. They were cleaning up some of the items within the temple. Now look at Leviticus 27. And verse 16, verse 16, the second definition is separation unto God. Okay, so when you hear separation, it's not just getting away from sin. When you're separated from sin, you're also separated to God. So when you're committed to God, when you're surrendered to God, that means you're already, see that, already separated from the wickedness, okay? So when you're committed to God, surrendered to God, that means the filthiness is behind you. If you're saying that you're committed to the Lord, but there's some part of you that compromises with your flesh and the world, you're not committed to God, see that? That's why it makes sense where God doesn't want 50-50. Okay. When God says you're going to serve me, what that means is if you're really surrendered to me, committed to me, then that means... The definition already means separated from the world. See that? Separated from sin. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're committed to God if you're staying stuck in sin. Okay? That's why majority of churches you see right now, they're not serving God. They can claim they're worshiping Jesus, serving God, but they're not. If they have wrong doctrine, if they have worldliness there, if they have fleshly sins there. See that? So, no, th then you know what they've done? They've wasted their entire Sunday serving God. Wow. That's, he that's hefty price. Wow. Think about the modern Bibles that they're reading. If that's not fully surrendered to God every word, then are they wasting their time then? See, this is important. Because your service for God could be a complete waste of time if you're not doing this correctly. All right, so Leviticus 27, verse 16. And if a man shall sanctify unto the Lord. See that? You're, when you're sanctifying, it's to the Lord. But notice how it's fully sold out, surrendered to him, separated from your own life, from your own ways. Some part of a field of his possession, then thy estimation shall be according to the seed thereof, and homer of barley seed shall be valued at 50 shekels of silver. See that? This is basically where you're selling yourself, selling what you have to him. It's separated from the world to God. Okay, so that's the two important meanings, separation from evil, one, separation to God. Now, go to Psalm 4.3, Psalm 4.3. So it's common sense that when you're separated by God, you have been set apart for the Lord to use as he desires. If 
you say that you want to serve God, then you better do it accordingly to whatever he wants. All right? So if there's complaint, bitterness, doubt, questioning God, or maybe, Lord, you could do it better, well, then you can't serve God. How can you think you can serve God? It should be common sense to you if you're going to come to this church that you should do whatever God wants, wants to do with your life. But if you don't have that in your mind, you're not going to last long in this church. See, this is very meaningful. We need to return to the basics. We keep forgetting these basics. We don't really understand them. Psalm 4, verse 3. But know that the Lord hath set apart him. See that? That's sanctification, right? But notice right here, that is godly for himself. That's whatever he desires to see fit with your life. Go to Romans 1, 1. Romans 1, 1. Now, this is the most famous passage for sanctification, perhaps. So you want to know this one. Romans 1, 1. Perhaps the most famous verse for separation from sin unto holiness. The problem with independent fundamental Baptist church, and I'll have to be honest, the mega churches, the neo-evangelicals, non-denoms, they're right to accuse us independent fundamental Baptists for being legalists, for being pharisaical. You might say, why? Because we do emphasize about separation from worldliness and from sin. But this separation can become so extreme that we forget what we're being separated unto. That's why IFB churches, they have so many rules, but a lot of people don't even know why they're doing them. If they know why they're doing them, then they would automatically know it's because I'm doing this for God. There is a Bible verse for this. There is a spiritual reason why I'm doing this. But no, they're just being clones and so ignorant. They're just doing it because I'm just supposed to separate from. And then it develops a frustration. There is no love of Jesus. There's no realness for genuine truth inside their hearts. And if that continues, that separation from sin is just going to build up more frustration. And you'll, you will become neo-evangelical. You will accuse IFB people for lack of love. Why? Because you had no love for God to begin with as you kept separating from sin. But if you had the love of God in you while, while you're being separated from sin, you have the proper meaning of separation from sin and separation to God, love of Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? It's very important. Why do I emphasize that too? Because of my Korean culture. Korean culture, I think that's the reason why. Uh, I'm sure some Korean Bible believers can agree with me. But this separation from has made it legalism, pharisaical, prideful, and too many splits and problems. And then the next generation live by codes. They're not passionate. They're not joyous about the Christian life. If I want my kids to separate from the world, I want them to be happy and know why they're doing it and find meaning to do it. But if they're just separation from because mommy and daddy told me, because pastor told me, because that's how the church is doing, you're not going to last long. I promise you. I guarantee that to you. Bondage. I like what he said there. Romans 1.1. 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Now look at this. Called to be an apostle. Separated. See that? But the separation is what? unto the gospel of God. See, when you're separated by God, you're not just taken away from fun and joy and the good things of life. Amen. See, that's a, the, the war. When, you get, when, when rules are set up, spiritual rules are set up in your life, you automatically assume, I'm separated from all the good things of life and joy and peace. No, you're separated from crud to joy and peace and real meaning in life. Comprende? Do you understand? Yeah. No, Christians don't comprende. They need to go back to basics. Okay. They're stuck on learning, I want to learn about pink-blooded aliens yeah. and end times and what's going on with Israel. <laughs> they, miss out, they miss out an important thing on sanctification that could have saved their lives. Now, so 
So we have to understand that wrong things in life that we're separated from desperately need to be replaced with something fulfilling and meaningful. Otherwise, if we keep separating from the wrong where we found our fulfillment, we're going to go back to that. So Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4. You need something fulfilling and meaningful to replace the wrong things that used to fulfill you. If the good things, the spiritual things in life are not meaningful, fulfilling to you, you will quickly go back to the wrong things that, that fulfill you. Because in our being, what we want, listen, in our being, what we want is not right and wrong. We could care less about that. Liberals could care less about that. That's why they say morals are relative. In our being, what we want is something fulfilling. Do you understand that? So what we need is to realize that if I want something fulfilling, wouldn't it be better that I'm in the right place to do it, not in the wrong place to do it? It's that simple. It's that simple. That's the reason why I can say, like I said earlier, in spite of a, almost a 40-hour flight from Africa to here, totally exhausted, it was worth going there, and it's worth coming here today, both me and the missus. Why? Wouldn't bed be more meaningful? Wouldn't resting be more meaningful? Our own home and enjoying the Silicon Valley, San Francisco lifestyle like all the lost people are doing, wouldn't that be more meaningful? Like some Christians are doing now? And that's why maybe they don't come to church today. Why? Because they're looking for something meaningful for their flesh in the wrong things. But see, we found, me and the missus found something meaningful with fellowship, singing, preaching, teaching the word of God, and just giving the gospel to people. Because that gives meaning to us. We could care less how much our flesh gets worn out. See, what people are hungry for is something meaningful. If you keep that in mind, you won't skip church. You won't skip Bible reading prayer. I know why you skip them. You don't find meaning in them. You're doing a check mark list of rules, right? Separation from, separation from, separation from, separation. That, that's why you don't last long. I guarantee you this. If church, all right, if coming here to the service and then... Wearing yourself out, doing everything for the brethren, getting involved in all that is literally your drug that you feel like you can uh, feel the bliss of heroin. You won't skip. But uh, you don't find that, right? So that's the reason why you're trying to find other meaning in life. Job, money, your rest time for your flesh, whatever, right? Okay, now, when we look at Ephesians 4, verse 25, look at this. When you're separation from, wherefore, putting away lying, see that? Yes. But it's replaced, speak every man truth with his neighbor. Verse 26, you're putting away anger, see that? But then notice at verse 28, 28, when you are not stealing, you're replacing it with work. Look at verse 29. When you are not, when you are separated from corrupt communication, you're replacing it with edification. When you are, uh, so uh, on and on, uh, verse 31, you put away bitterness and wrath, you're replacing it with verse 32, kindness and forgiveness and understanding others. So if uh, you want to separate from sin, you got to replace it with something good. Right. Now, bitterness is one of the hardest things to get over with. So, I mean, the Bible already gave you the answer, 32, right? You're not replacing it. So you're not being kind. Well, I am kind. No, maybe you're really not kind. Yeah. All right? So you just got to replace it with kindness. Or maybe you're not tenderhearted. You want tender... Uh, Strong-minded, independent, successful people don't have tender hearts. You know why? Because they're used to overcoming problems and, you know, building up tenacity and strength. You got to have a softness there. You have to have, to have a softness, understanding of others. That humbles you a lot. And then uh, 
when you do that, then it puts away the bitterness, whatever people have hurt you on. And then forgiving one another. If you don't forgive as much as Jesus Christ forgives you, then that's the reason why you still have bitterness. So I wonder, okay, if you really understand how much Christ forgave you. If you don't really understand how much Jesus Christ loved you enough to forgive you, that's why you're having a hard time forgiving. And that's why you're having a hard time letting go of bitterness. So if I were you, I'd think about the cross again, right? You've heard this pastor preach so many times about the cross and Jesus Christ's death and suffering. Hebrews verse by verse studies in the preachings. I think you need to go back to Calvary again. Just take some time there when bitterness sets in and think about how much you hurt Jesus Christ and how much he should be bitter against you. I mean, do you want Jesus Christ to say, yeah, I forgive you, but he's still bitter at you? Just like you Christians, oh, I forgive you, but I'm still bitter at you? So go back to Calvary, all right? What's this? This is basic doctrines. This is baby stuff, and oh, I, I already know. No, you don't know. Yeah. All right, now uh, let's go to 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2. Okay, I'm taking way too long. All right, let's hurry. Okay, sorry. All right. Some of you are used to this by now, right, from your pastor? Yeah. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 21. Now, this is very, very good. There are four points that can be summarized by sanctification, okay? So it is summarized when you are set apart. It is set apart in this phase, the exact sequence, okay? It is set apart by God, one. So God's the one involved. He's the one that empowers, causes you to be set apart. But then number two, it is for God. So when God takes you out, he's putting you that's committed for him. So no 50-50 with the world or your own way. Completely his desire. And then three, it is from sin. It takes you out of sin. Separated from sin. And then number four, it puts you unto, right? The replacement, the holy life. So sanctification can be summarized from everything I talked about earlier in those four phases, which I hope that... You wrote down and you kept a note. 2 Timothy 2.21 summarizes all that well. Notice, if a man therefore purge himself from these, we see right here separation from sin, he shall be a vessel. So notice right here, it's by God. God makes him a vessel. He shall be. That's passive, right? So God's involved. Unto honor. So notice right here, unto holiness sanctified so sanctification is involved in this whole process and meet for the master's use notice right here it's by god and for god yes. so it's involved right here and prepared unto every good work definitely by god he makes sure that he's prepared he's ready for every good work so if you're struggling with sanctification perhaps you need to ponder on this verse a lot and understand it more are you really set apart by God? Is anything of your flesh yourself involved? Are you really set apart for God? Maybe there's something there you didn't really clean up in your life. There's something you compromised. You didn't really surrender to God. Is it separated from sin? Is there still some stuff you're messing around with? And then unto a holy life, are you finding meaning in holiness. Is that what you're committing yourself to or are you just separated from? All right, now here's the second summary. So that's the first summary, uh, those four phases. The second summary is this, which is really good. Regeneration, that's a great doctrine, right? That we talked about. Our nature got changed. Justification, that's a great doctrine we talked about. The standing is changed, how you stand before God. Adoption, I didn't really cover that, but we'll cover it again someday. Uh, we'll cover it sometime in the future. The position is changed. So from a sinner or a child of the devil to become, the position changed to a child of God, right? Sanctification, what is the thing that changed? 
I mean, pretty much everything, don't you think so? It's the character. Character changes. That's the reason why you are probably still acting the same way that you had or struggling the same old ways that you had before. Your character didn't change. Even if you lived for God and surrendered to God, there's still some parts of you, your character, that did not change, did it? Okay? All right, now let's... Uh, I want you to write these three verses down because we don't have time, okay? But I just want you to write them down. But this is a good way to uh, see how justification and sanctification differ. See that? So, notice it's more judicial here. The judge considers you, declares you to be righteous. But here, it's your moral, your very living, you're made righteous. Justification is an instantaneous process. But sanctification is something that you have to pursue. You have to, a lifelong pursuit. You're all, you and I are still doing that. Uh, right here, it's imputed righteousness, your standing position before God. But here, it's more of a practice, your righteousness that's imparted for your walk. Over here, it's an indicative mood. You're justified. But here, it's imperative, the mood, where... Act like it. In other words, it's more demanded. Here, it's just a matter of fact. Over here, it's your union with Christ from his past death and resurrection. But here, it's not just a union, it's a communion in the present. So that's really nice how it's set up. Now I want you to look at the time of sanctification. So the three verses are as follows. The first one is 1 Corinthians 6.11. 1 Corinthians 6.11, and that's your past. The second one is John 17.17. 17. John 17.17, 17. that is your present, your present. The third one is 1 Thessalonians 5.23. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, you can guess what that is. That is your future. Now, how does that work? When you look at those three verses... Sanctification goes from the past tense. And how that goes is it's relating to your salvation. Okay? So you're separated from the penalty of sin. So because of that, you are saved. You cannot lose your salvation. One saved, always saved. Regarding your past, your salvation. But see, sanctification is not limited to your salvation. It also continues with your present, which is your living. So notice right here, it's separated from the power of sin. Sin still has power over your present living, doesn't it? So if you are truly sanctified, then you would be delivered from its power. If you're not, then presently you're not doing well. So that has to do with your living, living. The third one is the rapture. That's a future tense. So see, separated from the presence of sin. So the rapture separates you from any track of sin or any access to sin, which we all want. The very own presence of it is absolutely God. And that's what we want. So the third one is the rapture. So notice a complete sanctification or salvation here. It has to do with the past, which is your soul, the present, which is your spirit, and then the third, which is your body. Our body is not saved now. That's why we don't have a complete salvation. Do you see that? We're going to look at the reason for sanctification now. Uh, let's see. 1 Thessalonians 4.3. 1 Thessalonians 4.3. Why should I be sanctified? Well, I'll give you a couple good reasons. One, which is very simple, it's God's will. So the reason why you should be separated from sin unto holiness is that's the will of God. 1 Thessalonians 4.3, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. So that is God's will. The second one is John 17. Go to John 17, please. And then we'll look at verse 19, John 17, 19. <coughs> it's because you want to be more like Jesus, which is a 
common sense. How many of you want to be more like Jesus Christ? All right, if you want to, then be sanctified. How can you say you love Jesus? Oh, I love Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Sing that contemporary music garbage when you're hardly <laughs> sanctified from its music. Okay. See, if you want to be more like Jesus, then be sanctified. So, no, then, uh, I hate to say this, but you got to get this through your head. You don't want to be like Jesus Christ then. All right? You are lying when you say, no, I want to be like Jesus. No, if you want to be like Jesus, be sanctified. Get away from the world, from sin, and go on to holiness. If not, then the evidence is already given right there that you don't want to be like Jesus Christ. All right? Now, John 17 Verse 19, uh, the second one, if you have time, Philippians 3, verse 12, Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. The reason why Jesus Christ was sanctified, was made holy, is so that we can follow his example of sanctification. If he didn't live that way, then we have nothing to look up to to follow. If we say we want to follow Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ lived as a hippie, smoking and uh, singing contemporary Christian music, then we would all do that. Oh, excuse me, 90% of Christians are doing that when Jesus didn't do that. You know, it's very simple how you know what you're doing is wrong. Would Jesus do that? It's that simple. Would Jesus do that? People don't use their heads. John 17, 19. The Bible says, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. See that? Jesus Christ sanctified himself so that we could follow his example. Now, Philippians 3, 12 through 14. How can Christ be sanctified, made more holy? The answer is by pressing for something better. If you want to be made holy, you have to keep pressing for, striving for, I want something better in life. But if you keep seeing rules, if you keep making it hard for yourself and doing it your own way, you have no motivation. And it's hard for you to serve God. You have to have a motivation and desire that this is better. If you truly believe that, then you're going to strive for it. But if you think the world is better, comfort is better, your flesh is better, no wonder that you keep falling back to that. Because you think the flesh is better than holiness. Now, when you look at uh, Philippians 3, 12 to 14, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. See that? Paul realizes he's not perfect, 100% holy. But look at this, there's a striving. He points out, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Notice Paul is trying to follow Jesus' example of perfection, sanctification. So if he's going to follow that, it's by pressing for something better. He has that in mind. 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. John 10, 36. John 10, 36. So while you're struggling, while you're in pain and sanctification is hard to live, you ha usually when you're trying to go through something hard in work or in school or anything difficult in life, you have a goal in mind. You have a goal. Well, I'm doing this for this, and I can't wait to get that. It's going to be worth it. If you don't think like that in your sanctification walk, you're in trouble. You have to have a goal to strive for, pressing for something better. The sanctification of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ realized there were three things that helped with his sanctification, believe it or not. Believe it or not. By his Father, verse 36. <coughs> Bible says say ye of him whom the father hath sanctified and sent into the world thou blasphemest because I said I am the son of God 
So notice Jesus Christ was able to be sanctified because of the Father. Now, John 17, 19. John 17, 19. Wow, so Jesus Christ, who is God, received something that helped with his sanctification. So, if you want the same thing, the same tip that helped Jesus himself, I think you and I would want that, right? So one is the Father. The second one is himself. John 17, 19, himself. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. The third one, believe it or not, is 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. Believe it or not, it's by his people as well. By his people. So we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and uh, verse 15. Notice right here, but sanctify the Lord God. All right, but look how God is sanctified. In your what? Ain't that something? Ain't that something? By his people. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So what will help you with your sanctification is uh, by God's people. That's something. That's something. So the sanctification of Christ, it, it went by his father. It is by himself and also his own people. Hebrews 12, uh, Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 14. Well, that puts a whole new perspective on how you're sanctifying God in your hearts, right? That's another heavy weight. A lot of us are not really doing a good job on that. That's why they don't think Jesus is real. The lost world don't think G God or Jesus is that holy, is that meaningful. Not because he isn't, it's because the failure on your part to sanctify him. So that's a heavy meaning right there. So, by following Christ's example, we can see why uh, three helpful things that are extremely helpful to be sanctified by our Father in heaven, by himself, and by God's people. Would we follow that example? Sanctification, a fourth reason, it makes us permanently perfect in Christ. Permanently perfect in Christ. Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever. Look at this. Them that are what? Sanctified. All right. If you're sanctified, he's given you, he's giving you an opportunity for permanent perfection. And uh, wow, 99% of us Christians fail in that, don't we? If you want to be perfect like Jesus Christ, that's a reason to be sanctified. Romans 6. Romans 6, 22. It results with fruits of holiness. It results with fruits of holiness. Now, you want fruits in your life? You and I want fruits in our life. That really encourages us. But wouldn't it be even more so with fruits that are right, that are done right, that are holy, that pleases the Lord? So it results with fruits of holiness. That's why we want to be sanctified. Romans 6, 22, verse 22. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness. Acts 26, 18. Acts 26, 18. The last one, which is very obvious, is it guarantees you an inheritance after salvation. A lot of you are going to miss out your reward in heaven, and I'm including myself when I say you, because we don't sanctify ourselves. So that's the obvious one, Acts chapter 26 and verse 18. So we've seen six things, six reasons for sanctification. One, it's God's will. Two, to follow Jesus Christ. Three, sanctification of Christ, which is very helpful. <coughs> Four, makes us permanently perfect in Christ. Fifth, results with fruits of holiness. And six, guarantees our inheritance. 
26.18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance, but inheritance among them which are what? Sanctified by faith that is in me. Now let's go to exit, uh, uh, Genesis 2, verse 3. Genesis 2 and Exodus 31. Genesis 2 and Exodus 31. Now, we're going to cover the objects of sanctification. The objects of sanctification. A lot of people don't know what's really holy. Now, a lot of this is going to be Old Testament, so thank God we're not in it. Otherwise, a lot of us would be dead by now. But what you're going to find out is some of the stuff in the Old Testament, you can see in some level it still has application to us. Uh, you're going to see um, how God treats uh, certain objects to be holy. You might change your lifestyle after this, okay? Because we think that every object or things in this world is we can do whatever we want. But I'm going to tell you some things that you never thought about before, and you're going to treat those things very differently. Now, the first thing is the Sabbath, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3. The Sabbath, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3. Notice right here uh, what the Bible says. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now notice right here, the seventh day is important to God. He sanctified it. As a matter of fact, in the law of Moses, which is Exodus 31, 15, go there. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is a Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. See that? It's holy to God, sanctified. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. You die. Now, God took the ob observation of a day to uh, rest and to think about him so seriously that he would kill you for it. Now, this obviously doesn't apply to us today. Otherwise, Seventh-day Adventists should have killed each other by now. And there would be no Seventh-day Adventists. There shouldn't be a Seventh-day Adventist church. They should all be dead by now, if you're going to be very honest. See, so that's why we don't believe in Sabbath keeping, okay? Because they don't even keep it themselves. But what can we still learn from here? The point is, is that we all know that's Old Testament. That's why uh, that has no application to us. But there's something here. The point is why God set that up in the Old Testament, and thank God he didn't do it right now, but he set it up that way because what meant to him is a specific, listen, a specific 24-hour day or a length of time where you do nothing in this world but just meditate on him. He took it so seriously, you die. Do you have an object like that in your life? Let's, let's close the teaching, all right? Our life will change completely doing that. I guarantee you this, every one of you will have victory against sin. Uh, every one of you will have a happier mood, a more healthy life. Everything's going to change after that. You want evidence? I'll give you evidence. Just set apart a specific time of like summer camp. Isn't it life, life changing? Like literally life changing your whole life? Why? You set apart a day away from all the crud and busyness and anything not even sinful things in the world. Just separate from that and just think about God and worshiping God with other brethren like the Jews did. You give a good length of time on that. That's why we take Sunday services seriously. See that? We take it seriously. That's why we meet once a week at the very least. Why? We... Why? You try going on without it. And you know I'm right. You go downhill real quick. Try skipping your Bible reading and prayer time. All right? You know you go downhill. That's why you're not holy. 
Well, I'm having trouble with this sin. Uh, uh, is there a tip? Is there? No, no, you just make time to be holy, observing God and worshiping Him away from anything in life. But when you keep using your kids, your sickness, your health, your busyness and work as an excuse, see, you're not doing quote unquote Sabbath keeping. What is this quote unquote Sabbath keeping? Making a specific, a good length of time away from anything to do in this world and just committed to God and the brethren and worshiping him. And just being lost in a good time in that. Life changing. There are six more objects if we have time. Exodus 29. Uh, we won't turn there for time's sake. Just write them down. Now, in this... Uh, oh. Oh, well, what am I going to do? Just do what you got to do, Gene. Okay. All right. Uh, so, the Exodus 29, 43 through 44. Exodus 29, 43 through 44. The tabernacle, the second object is the tabernacle and its contents. So, that's why God killed a zealous saint for touching one of them. As 2 Samuel 6.6. 6. Write down 2 Samuel 6.6. 6. Well, I love the Lord and I want to serve him. It doesn't matter. He dropped you dead for uh, touching a content that was considered holy. And that's why even Jesus considered money that was given to be sanctified by the temple itself. Matthew 23.17. Matthew 23, 17. Okay, so why is that important? So, thank God that's Old Testament times, and we're not saying if you touch the Bible, you're going to drop dead, but this should make us seriously think how God uses certain objects for his glory. For example, he has the preacher preaching. He has that word of God in your hand. For example, the money you give to the Lord Okay? If they're used for holy purposes, it's not as literal as in the Old Testament time that where you touch it, you die. But it shows right here that in the New Testament, if God took it that seriously in the Old Testament, I mean, at least at some level, can we not consider it today how God would see it? No, we just uh, treat them like nothing. And because of that, that's why there's so much rebellion in the church. That's why the word of God is being corrected. That's the reason why people put the word of God on a shelf, let it collect dust, and hardly read it. And that's the reason why people, they want to be stingy with their money and not give it to the Lord. Why? We lost our purpose of holiness. We've got to think about certain objects that are sanctified. It's going to change our very living more. It'll put a little bit more of the fear of the Lord, don't you think? Yeah. Now, uh, Matthew 23, 17 is that other verse I told you to write. That's why Jesus considered money to be sanctified by the temple itself. Now, the third one is the altar, the altar, Exodus 29, 37. Write down Exodus 29, 37. That is why the animal sacrifices on the altar were holy enough to forgive sins. Because of that altar, sanctified the animal sacrifice. That's why God said, okay, I can forgive you of your sin because that altar sanctified the animal. So it was contributing to that process. That's Matthew 23, 19. Uh, Matthew chapter 23 and verse 19. It makes you consider about what did God consider to be the altar in the New Testament. So Old Testament, we don't have that. It's not like when you touch this altar, you die, or it makes you holy, or something magical. But New Testament is pretty more serious. Who's considered to be the altar? Your sacrifice for God. That's considered holy. How are you treating that? Bitterness? Complaining? Whining? Or you hardly suffer, you're in layout to say in comfort? Quite an altar you have. We don't think about objects that are holy. We treat them, everything irreverent, irreverently like it's nothing. Like it's our own. We can do whatever we want. 
No wonder you're unhappy. No wonder you keep suffering consequences of sin and this whole world's falling apart. Uh, the fourth one is uh, marriage. The fourth one is marriage. That's 1 Corinthians 7, 14. 1 Corinthians 7, 14. Marriage is also an object that's sanctified. That's why we emphasize so much in avoiding fornication, okay? That's why we emphasize so much about, hey, don't divorce and et cetera, all that kind of stuff. That's 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 points out why fornication should be avoided. So that's why the pastor here, your pastor here, takes uh, dating, counseling, and fornication seriously. Uh, opposite uh, genders uh, living under the same roof. Oh, why are you taking that so seriously? Oh, you got to understand my condition here. It's hard to live in the Bay Area. We share room and stuff like that. What's wrong with fornication? Uh, that is a huge problem with me as a pastor in this area, this culture, because it's normalized here. Right. See, like I keep telling you, we treat it as nothing. We treat everything normalized. That ain't normal. Okay? That ain't normal. You wait till you get married. Period. Why? It's holy. If you don't think your marriage is holy, it shows how much you really value your marriage. If marriage is that important for you, if you really love your spouse, if that is the most important thing in your life, then how can you treat it irreverently? It's nothing to you. You know why I know marriage is nothing to you? You divorced. You know why people date and then they go to the next guy, next guy, next guy, and stuff like that? Yeah, it shows how, uh, how reverently they treat it. If you want the one you love for all your life, okay, you better take that more seriously, reverently, as if it's holy and sacred to you. Comprende? All right. Uh, the name of God, Ezekiel 36, 23. Ezekiel 36. 23. And that's why God stones you to death for taking his name in vain. So, how well do people take God's name in vain today? No, it's nothing. It's normalized. I keep hating that. I keep hating to say that, where it's normalized to take God's name in vain. It's not normal. But we made it normal. And due to that, we lost our sanctification and the world's falling apart. Yep. So how well are you treating the name of God? Again, that's Old Testament. That's why you're not dead. The sixth one is fasting. Fasting. That's Joel 1.14. Joel 1.14. So that's why it makes sense in... Uh, so how am I going to say this? Fasting is considered to be so holy that in 2 Corinthians, I think it was 1 Corinthians 7, it mentioned that even marriage itself, which is considered to be holy and sanctified, that there's no partaking in that. You can't even do that when you're set apart by fasting. That's how sacred and powerful fasting is. As a matter of fact, fasting is so holy, it made God overlook the great wickedness of Nineveh. So if there's something that you have a great wickedness, then maybe you should start fasting. You know why I take altar calls seriously? Oh, I don't believe in altar calls. No, you should, because, I mean, that's, I mean, that's not fasting itself, but we're trying to get there. Basically, a moment of time to pray to the Lord away from the cares of our flesh. And we don't eat until afterwards. See? So... If we want the forgiveness of our sins, great wickedness, yeah, I think at the very least we should have altar calls. Don't you think so? All right, so that's Jonah 3, 5, and verse 10. Jonah 3, 5, and 10. Okay, the next object is the body. The body. Oh, oh. So that's 1 Corinthians 3, 17. 1 Corinthians 3, 17. 
And that's probably the hardest one, because you honestly think that your emotions are your own, so you can feel whatever you want. Your thoughts are your own, you can think whatever you want. Uh, your actions are your own, you can do whatever you want. And because of that, that's the reason why uh, your, your living is not holy. You know, if there's something that you want to remember, God kills you for taking his name in vain in the Old Testament. God kills you if you worked in the Sabbath day during the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, God will start killing you for messing with his body. Woo! That's harder than Old Testament, don't you think so? <laughs> That's 1 Corinthians 3.17. But then 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 points out that that's why your body does not belong to you. It uh, belongs to the Lord for him to use. Why? In the Old Testament, he's not in that physical temple. He's in your body, which is his temple. So New Testament is a higher standard than Old Testament, believe it or not. Now we're going to talk about the means of sanctification, the means of sanctification, and uh, write them all down, okay? You're going to do a lot of writing, get ready. Number one is by God, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30. So that was a no-brainer from what we learned. If you want to be sanctified, you need God involved. So the second one is by the word of God, by the word of God which is John 17, 17. John 17, 17. Now, this is probably the most important section for you because if you want to learn how to be sanctified, you need to start doing these things. So, one, we need to rely on God more. So I would pray more to God about it. Help me to be holy. I would read the Bible more. I would attend Bible study classes, write them down, memorize verses more. Third one is by prayer, by prayer. 1 Timothy 4, 5. 1 Timothy 4, 5. That's why we take prayer meetings seriously. That's why you should pray often. You don't, if you're not living holy, I'm going to ask you how often do you pray. Simple. Number four, by chastisement. By chastisement. Hebrews 12, 10 through 11. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10 through 11. Well, why are bad things happening to me? Because you're not living holy, so God has to do it for you. It's sure working, isn't it? Number five, by yielding to God, by yielding to God. Romans 6, 19, Romans 6, 19. So give in to the Holy Spirit what he's telling you to do. But if you hesitate, if you do but this, but that, then you're not going to be made holy. Number six, by the blood of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 13, 12, Hebrews 13, 12. Well, I don't believe in pleading the blood. You mid-ax hyper-dispensationalist, you, I believe in pleading the blood if I want to keep living a holy life. So keep saying, Lord, forgive me, wash it in the blood of Jesus Christ, all right? Make that like a habitual thing. Number seven, by ourselves. By ourselves. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Well, I need some help and I need some help. No, you've you got to start doing it yourself. Well, there's a point in my life where nothing absolutely helps me. What am I going to do? Good. Now you're in that right place. Do it yourself. All right. Symbols of sanctification. Man, this is encouraging. Yeah, right? Isn't it? Yeah. Symbols of sanctification. Four symbols that God has used to picture sanctification. Can you guess what they are? Think in your mind. Well, can you guess what they are? What the... What certain pictures symbolized holiness. That's why he took those things seriously. That's why Jesus used them often in parables. That's why the Bible often used it. But parallel or crossword search these and it will be eye-opening to a lot of other doctrines. One is the blood sacrifice of animals. Blood sacrifice of animals. Leviticus 8.15. Leviticus 8.15. Why? Because it symbolized the blood sacrifice of Jesus. And that's Hebrews 9, 13 through 14. Hebrews 9, 13 through 14. The second one is oil. Oil. That's Exodus 30, verse 25 through 32. 
Exodus 30, verse 25 through 32. Why? Because it symbolized God the Holy Spirit. And that's 1 Samuel 16, 13. 1 Samuel 16, 13. The third one is water. The third one is water. Exodus 30, verse 17 through 24. Exodus 30, verse 17 through 24. Why? Because it symbolizes the Bible. It symbolizes the Bible. The fourth one is the rock at Meribah. The rock at Meribah. That's Numbers 20, verse 11 through 13. Numbers chapter 20, verse 11 through 13. I don't think I told you this, how it symbolized the Bible. Um, that's Ephesians 5.26. Ephesians 5.26, if I didn't say that. The rock at Meribah, the reason why that's a symbol of sanctification and Moses got kicked out of the promised land for not following God is because it symbolized God the Son, his sacrifice. 1 Corinthians 10, 2 through 4. 1 Corinthians 10, 2 through 4. And uh, that shows the Holy Spirit's role in sanctification from what we observe from the objects and then the means of sanctification and then the symbols. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Now, Father, I pray that you'll dismiss us with your blessing and help us to apply these principles of sanctification into our lives. Thank you so much for teaching us so much truth, including even the basics. We get something new and learn more truths. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.